let's turn to our exciting program from military might to strategic partnerships, the US and the Middle East, and to our distinguished panel, starting with our moderator, Ambassador Joseph Westfall, whom I am happy to introduce. Ambassador Westfall has had an illustrious career and is a senior global fellow at the Joseph H. Lauder Institute of Management and International Studies at the Wharton School here at Penn. Dr. Westfall was the US ambassador to the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia from March 2014 until January of 2017. Prior to his appointment, he was the undersecretary of the army and its chief management officer. He also held the positions of assistant secretary of the army and acting secretary of the army. Dr. Westfall began his career in 1975 as a professor of, drum rolls, political science at Oklahoma State University. In 2002, he became the chancellor of the University of Maine system and a professor of political science. He also served as director of the Tishman Environmental Center and provost of the New School University in New York. Thanks so much to all four of you for joining us today. Ambassador Westfall, the floor is yours to introduce our panelists and to begin our conversation. And we hope that all of your mics are on. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, if uh, you don't hear us for any reason, if because of the masks, we're not, our volume is too low, just wave to us, and let us know. Uh, we want to make sure everybody, everybody hears us. Uh, I'm not going to do very long and broad introductions because we don't have a lot of time and we have quite a bit of a uh, really interesting discussion to follow. So as, uh, as, as I think to, to be more expedient, I'm going to just dive right in. And I'm going to begin with the person all the way to my right, Ambassador uh, Roebuck. Uh, William Roebuck was an ambassador. When I was ambassador in Saudi Arabia, he was ambassador in, in Bahrain. But his most interesting assignment of late, he's a long standing career diplomat who served all over the Middle East in places like Libya and Syria and Iraq and Israel. But his most interesting assignment, most recent, was as the Deputy Special Envoy for the Global Coalition Against ISIS, where he was embedded with special forces serving as a senior US diplomat in Syria. So ambassador, did we defeat ISIS? Uh, it's a good question. Um, I think the short answer is yes, we did. Um, I should immediately clarify that and uh, caveat it a bit, but uh, we definitely uh, dealt ISIS a catastrophic military setback. Um, we did it with a toolkit of, uh, of useful tools. The two most important ones uh, that we were able to use, uh, one was a global coalition that we put together, um, 83 members, mostly countries, nation states, about five uh, international organizations that went with it. It was that global coalition which uh, ensured that we had the military contributions, that it was a shared burden, it wasn't just the United States doing it, um, that there was money for stabilization assistance, and that we were focused uh, diplomatically on a common uh, set of goals, countering ISIS's uh, propaganda, countering ISIS terror finance, um, making sure there was money for stabilization assistance. These types of, of tasks is what the global coalition um, focused on. Um, it was that useful international uh, organization. And then we had a very effective local partner, uh, the Syrian Democratic Forces, the SDF is uh, for short. Um, I don't really, I mean, words escape me about how effective they were. Um, they had the heart to fight. They could absorb casualties. They had good command and control. They were highly disciplined. The US Special Forces that I was embedded with often told me they were the most effective local force they had ever trained or worked with. And so those two prongs together, the global coalition and that effective local um, organization, uh, the SDF together, um, we were able to uh, 
deal ISIS a catastrophic military setback. Um, we defeated their so-called physical caliphate. Um, technically, we don't say we defeated them because there are remnants, some lethal remnants in areas of Iraq, uh, in parts of Syria, but they're not able to plan external operations from uh, the areas where we were in Syria and Iraq. Their leadership has been decimated and they are no longer able to do military operations in a significant what, way. What about ISIS uh, K in Afghanistan? There are affiliates of ISIS outside of uh, Iraq and Syria. Um, they remain a lethal uh, threat. Um, they operate fairly independently. ISIS Khorasan, ISIS K is one of them, one of the most lethal. Um, and they are going to be a group that we will have to keep an eye on. We are no longer in Afghanistan, so we'll have to do it over the horizon. Um, I believe we will be able to do that. Uh, and we'll use the same tools that we use with other ISIS affiliates, whether in, in Africa or elsewhere. Um, ISIS is a worldwide organization, so we dealt them a military setback, but they're still out there. Thank you. Um, the three of us actually worked together and, and, and uh, collaborated quite a bit during the Obama administration. Uh, I was ambassador in Saudi Arabia. At that time, Ambassador Robach was ambassador to Bahrain, and Ambassador Silliman was ambassador to Kuwait, later to become ambassador to Iraq. And uh, Ambassador Patterson was the assistant secretary for Near Eastern Affairs. Uh, and you also handled North Africa as well. So she was basically the coordinator and the, the leader of the group in a way. Uh, and we'll talk a little bit about that. Uh, we're going to spread the questions around. So let me turn to Ambassador Silliman. Who, uh, we all retired, by the way, at the end of the Obama administration. At that point, uh, Ambassador Silliman was the ambassador to Iraq. Now, two things are happening recently that are really interesting. One is uh, this summit that was called in Iraq that brought countries like Saudi Arabia and Iran to the table. Um, yes, it wasn't the leaders of these two countries uh, and others, but I want you to talk a little bit about that and what you think that means. And then as a follow-up, um, Iraq is uh, going to have an election on October 10th. Iraq has been mired in so much conflict for so long. Uh, what are your expectations for that election? Thank you very much. I'm very happy to be here at uh, Perry World House and at the University of Pennsylvania. Uh, and thank you, uh, Ambassador Westfall, for inviting us. For the Iraq summit that was just held, it is part of a larger vision that the Iraqi Prime Minister Mustafa Al-Qadami has about trying to give Iraq an identity that is Iraqi, which is something that it has lacked, lacked really since 2003. It had an identity very much tied to the American military occupation, and more recently an identity that is threatened by the closeness of many of its political factions and armed factions to Iran. He's trying to carve out an international vision of Iraq as an intermediary, uh, quite literally a middleman as the country in the middle of a lot of areas of problems in the Middle East. So when he became prime minister, one of the first things that he did was he reached out to King Abdullah of Jordan and President Sisi of Egypt and created an informal triumvirate of uh, countries that were friendly with the West, friendly with uh, the Arab countries of the Gulf, uh, and wanted also to help Iraq chart its own course. This has grown since then, and he has found that Iraq has been able to play a productive role in holding meetings in Iraq between countries that, are, that have trouble agreeing on neutral ground. Uh, for example, just last week, a fourth set of negotiations between Saudi Arabia and Iran were held at the VIP lounge at Baghdad International Airport with the Iraqi Prime Minister in attendance at the meeting. And it is this meeting that seems to have come up with a very sketchy, but a good plan to have Saudi Arabia and Iran work on a solution to uh, reducing violence in Yemen, for which both the Iranians and the Saudis bear a great deal of responsibility. What is interesting, um, Joe, in the question that you asked about the summit, um, last month, 
the prime minister hosted a summit that included a lot of irreconcilable neighbors, Saudi Arabia, the United Arab Emirates, Iran, Turkey, Jordan, Egypt, and interestingly, uh, President uh, uh, Macron of France. And the French, again, getting out of the Middle East a bit in the search for an independent foreign policy role for France, have been trying to help strengthen Iraq and Macron and Academy have cooperated quite well. And an idea that was born at a meeting in Paris and was to have been held in Paris, uh, the Iraqi prime minister essentially convinced the French president to let him hold that summit in Baghdad to strengthen Iraq's identity, to give Iraq a little more international agency. So what I think that this prime minister is doing is showing to Iraqis uh, who have to vote in two weeks or in a week, uh, that he has been effective in defending Iraqi interests internationally and has been probably the first real prime minister since 2003 to chart a very clearly Iraqi path in foreign policy. So that's what I think is most significant. Yeah, that. that's good. That's good. Um, I, I should tell you all that um, Ambassador Silliman is the president and CEO of the, uh, I wasn't sure if they were the Arab Gulf States Institute in Washington. Arab Gulf States Institute. In and Washington. this very tall gentleman to my right, Ambassador Roebuck, is the executive vice president. Yeah, you see, of the same he, organization. Just, he just had to run with that. See, um, but I do, I do uh, want to suggest to you, if you're interested in anything going on in the Middle East, particularly in, around the Gulf states uh, and Iran, um, their this think tank is really, really good, and they do incredibly good work. So uh, visit their website. Let me turn to uh, Ambassador Patterson for a few minutes. Now, uh, have any of you watched this TV program? It's been on for a little while. I think it's on Apple TV called um, uh, Fiasco. Fiasco. It's interesting because, you know, I worked in the Reagan administration. That's how old I am. But it's about Reagan administration, and Reagan administration came into power uh, right after uh, President uh, Carter failed to win re-election, and part of the reason for that was he was unsuccessful, at least until the elections, to free the hostages that had been taken by the Iranians during the Iranian Revolution. Uh, and there were other issues associated with his loss as well in the economy and so on. But Ronald Reagan was very critical of President Carter of the Iranian hostage issue. Lo and behold, uh, he comes into power and there's so much turmoil in the Middle East that he gets caught up in it. It includes, of course, the, um, the bombing of the uh, Marine barracks in Lebanon, a number of kidnappings and um, uh, hijackings of airplanes, lots of people get, getting killed. It's, it's just complete turmoil in, in the Middle East. And he, frankly, no one knows how to deal with it. It's, it's you know, uh, it's, it's a really tough situation. And then uh, beyond that, uh, you begin to see a significant amount of strife in Central America our backyard, as we like to say, and particularly with, you know, uh, Marxist, communist, leftist groups, uh, insurgencies in El Salvador, in Nicaragua in particular, and the show gets into the whole business of, you know, his efforts to support the Contras in Nicaragua. It's worth seeing, it's very interesting. But Ambassador Patterson has a very interesting career because while she wasn't an ambassador during that period of time, soon after that, she became an ambassador to El Salvador. And then after that, she was rewarded with an ambassadorship to Colombia, which was in a war with the FARC, you remember. And then just because she did so good there, they rewarded her even more by giving her the embassy in Pakistan one of the toughest places to, to be an ambassador in. But then she got a really, really plumb job, real easy job. She became the ambassador to Egypt during the time of the Arab Spring, 
during the fall of Mubarak, during the rise of Sisi. Um, so she has had this experience uh, of seeing all of these different crises uh, and having to follow up on some of them. So I want to ask her uh, a, a question, not so much about what you experienced in those particular postings, but we do want to hear, hear about that, but about how you see things from now on as we look forward. Does the United States fail to have a strategic framework for dealing with crises around the world? And uh, are we dealing with these crises primarily on a political basis? Or is there something else that we need to be doing? So I think it's extraordinarily difficult for the US to have a strategic approach to foreign policy because our political system is too fractured and it's always been fractured. And we have uh, too many conflicting impulses in the US in, in our domestic situation to sustain a strategic vision. That doesn't mean we don't have principles, uh, historically human rights, historically free trade, historically liberal immigration, um, but these are under enormous pressures depending on who's in power. And let me give you an example. Uh, the Biden administration came in with a renewed dedication to human rights in the Middle East and that lasted about as long as the, uh, uh, the, as the war between Israel and Gaza, and they needed the Egyptians to help negotiate a peace treaty with, with Hamas. And then I would say the more, the more um, realpolitik uh, impulse took over there. So it, it's extremely difficult to sustain a strategic vision. And, and I've often seen, I was in the Foreign Service for 43 years. The first couple of years, maybe the first year is a little disruptive with any administration because you write a lot of papers and they want to review the previous administration's activities. But our policy tends to revert toward the mean. In other words, the United States really doesn't have that much maneuver, maneuvering ability in foreign policy. Very, very interesting. Uh, look, it's nine. It's four twenty-eight. We are supposed to end at five o'clock. So let's. Uh, if you if you have questions, I mean, I, I really want participation. I really want all of you to to have a chance to ask questions. Uh, don't worry. There's no such thing as a stupid question. Whatever it is that's on your mind that you might want to ask, you've got three incredibly experienced and fantastic. Uh, uh, ambassadors here. So line up at the mic and ask your questions. Uh, I'll give you the floor. And since you're walking up, Ray want to walk up first, go ahead and ask a question. Hey, everybody. Thanks for uh, being here. It's really exciting to have you guys all here and share your wisdom. So my question is about how we can bring some of the lessons learned, particularly about radicalization of folks here to the United States. I think a lot of us, probably everybody has at least seen online people that they knew or know now becoming radicalized in more homegrown ways. Um, and, and what have we learned oh, while we were overseas? And what have you guys learned that we can bring back and apply here in the United States to prevent this in, in folks you know, here? Let me, let me, let me take a, a quick stab at that. In the case of Saudi Arabia, I think the most important thing, and I believe this would be the case with any country, it is really important for us to have a presence in that country to have a senior person as an ambassador who has the attention of the leadership of that country and that we are fully, fully engaged in every aspect. Diplomacy works in my view, it really does work. But we've gotten to a point now where uh, our country doesn't respect the role of ambassadors anymore. The White House, the National Security Staff, which is way too big, and mostly made up of young people who don't really have the experience, think that they can run, they can be the ambassador, they can be the diplomats around the world. And they don't have, we don't have a presence and we don't have the influence that we should have. So I think the first thing we need to do is, is, is create a presence and have a dialogue and be able to speak very clearly to these countries about what their mutual priority should be. Let me take a stab at that. We ask our embassies that question when ISIS was 
growing? And, and the answers to me were very interesting because there was a lot of speculation, well, maybe it's the Saudis promoting their conservative brand of Islam, which I'm sure was a factor. But most of these people that went to or that went that were attracted to ISIS had never fit, set foot in a mosque. Uh, most of them knew nothing about Islam. Most of them were disaffected, poor people, sort of on the margins of society, what I would call sort of low-level criminals. And yeah, that probably does have implications uh, for the U.S. Um, but that was what that was what our embassies told us about the the. These people were easily radicalized, much like uh, joining a gang in Los Angeles or, or the suburbs of New York would be. Yeah, let, let me go to sort of a level deeper than that, and it may have a little more application domestically in the United States. I had the opportunity to talk to a number of former ISIS and former Al Qaeda people at, during my time in Iraq and tried to figure out. Uh, what had taken them into the movement, uh, what had brought some of them into the leadership of the movement. And what I found is that the number one issue seemed to be lack of political empowerment on a very personal level, that they felt that they were unable to operationalize what they wanted to do in their lives or with their families, that they, they didn't have um, individual agency but the, the movement gave them something that empowered them, that gave them goals that they could accomplish as horrible, horrible as they might have been. Um, some of that also went around, uh, was around economic disempowerment. And again, you had and religious re beliefs. Um, but the one that I found that was most interesting was lack of a feeling of empowerment um, in a person's uh, ability to make choices for himself um, and his or her family in some cases. So I, that may be the thing in the United States that might have the most application. The examples are very different, the societies are very different, but the idea that a person, that much of the leadership of Al Qaeda, of ISIS, of most of the world's terrorist groups are not disenfranchised, poor, uneducated. They are often have university educations. They feel empowered enough to use their education, to use their personal skills, in service of this goal that they have taken from a movement. So again, if there's something in there that you can take to do good in the United States, please, please do it because we could we could use the help. Bill, anything? Uh, I would make one um, observation. The most effective counter radicalization program that I was aware of uh, in my latter stage of my career was one that the Saudis actually ran um, in the uh, mid 2000s. And the way that they did this is to find uh, people who were similar in ideology and mental uh, makeup to the people they were trying to um, counter radicalize. You have to you have to approach the mentality and get close to it, but have people who are on the fundamental other side of the divide against using violence or destabilizing activities. And the Saudis were able to do that and combine it with uh, some economic incentives, uh, getting some of these uh, young ISIS radicals uh, married off and getting them a job. And they were quite effective in peeling away a lot of people from a radical background and getting them back, reintegrated back into right. society. And bringing their families to bear on that as well. Um, Thank what, you very much. What was your name? Uh, my name is Fav Jimenez. Right. Thank you. Thanks for, for your question. Go ahead. Hi, can can you give us your name? And Hi, I'm Lauren. Nice to meet everyone. Can you hear me now? Oh, yeah. Really close. Sorry. Hi, I'm Lauren. Nice to meet everyone. And thank you all so much. I have a very broad general question um, in regards to Israel and being, you know, a non Arab state in the Middle East, democracy, one of the United States' biggest allies. So, where do you see the future of Israel in the center of the Middle East, really, as a whole, with you have? Hezbollah, Hamas, you have, you know, Syria, you just have all these countries that hate it per se, and being one of America's strongest allies, just kind of like what you see as a whole for the country. Good question. Uh, and in fact, uh, if in answering that, would you talk a little bit about the uh, Abraham Accords? Yeah. Okay. And why don't you try first? East? Not, not the center. I'm just saying like Israel in being you know, a small country that's not an Arab country, that's a democracy, that's one of 
you know, a strategic ally to the United States for military purposes, um, economic purposes, et cetera, just the future of the state, the country? Well, I think the, the future of the state is enormously promising. I mean, it has one of the strongest armies in the world now. And you're talking to someone who's Israeli. That's why. That's yeah, right. no, it <laughs> has one of the strongest armies in the world. It has no military competition whatsoever from its, from its neighbors, and that's changed. I know the Israelis are concerned about Iran, but I think some of their concerns are, are overstated. Um, the Palestinian issue, I, and I think this may have repercussions, seems to have faded in Israel, and they seem no particular uh, reason to resolve that. But I think, I think the relationship between the US and Israel is extraordinarily strong over many administrations, and I see I think that nothing has changed with the Biden administration on the Abraham Accords. That's been a goal of U.S. foreign policy for 75 years, to have better relations between Israel and Arab states. And the real winner seems to be the relationship between the UAE and Israel, because frankly, both are rich, technologically sophisticated countries, whereas the previous agreements with Jordan and Israel, those are not rich and technologically advanced countries. So it looks like the economic benefits are really quite considerable. Let me take an answer maybe 10 or 20,000 feet higher than this. Um, when I was a kid, I grew up in a bipolar world. It was the United States and the Soviet Union. My career has been spent in a unipolar world where the United States was militarily and economically dominant everywhere in the world and there was no competitor. What you're seeing now is a transition to a multipolar world. And that's not just American competition with China, it's with China and Russia, but it's a variety of regional players that are beginning to operationalize their own desires, their own national interests in the region. In the Middle East, um, the traditional power centers, uh, Cairo, Damascus, Baghdad, going back a thousand years, are all weakened. So you see Riyadh, Abu Dhabi, um, Jerusalem, Tel Aviv, Ankara, Tehran, picking up some of the slack that has been left. And depending upon what happens with an American presence in the Middle East, military, economic, political, that change could move in different directions. So I think that um, Israel is one of the strong powers in the Middle East. Israel will probably be able to find common cause with other regional players with similar interests, as Ambassador Patterson pointed out, like the UAE, where there's a really fortuitous social and economic match between the two countries. But they will also have continuing competition with a probably larger number of non-Arab regional countries, not just Iran. Uh, you see the tension with Turkey, obviously, um, and other Arab countries that will place their interest or Palestinian interests uh, ahead of you know, good relations with Israel. So I, I see this as a broad global change that will affect Israel and the Middle East as it will most parts of the world. I'll just add my two cents in from Saudi Arabia. I do believe, I really do believe, and I've had those conversations with the leadership of Saudi Arabia, that it is in their interest, and I think they believe this, it is in this interest, in their interest, eventually to have diplomatic relations with Israel. The conflicts of the past are, are just that. I'll give you an example. The king of Saudi Arabia, who's in his late 80s, um, when I was leaving Saudi Arabia to uh, retiring and coming back to the United States, uh, we had a meeting, and he said to me, please tell President Trump, President-elect Trump at the time, um, that we believe in the right of, this, of, a, of the state of, uh, we believe in the rights of the Palestinians, and we believe in a two-state solution. That was not necessarily the same feeling shared by his son, who actually runs the place, who's much younger, who didn't live in those days of Palestinian strife or anything like that, and who sees Israel as a real power, as Ambassador um, Patterson mentioned, and who uh, understands that in the future, there is no choice but to deal with, Saudi, with uh, Israel as, as a partner. And they, they, they're interested in trade, they're interested in, in technology, um, they're no longer interested in the in the competition that they have learned. So, and the Abraham uh, Abraham Accords are um, some evidence of that. Uh, so, thank you for your question. Thank you. Um, let me ask uh, a couple of questions from 
just uh, stay there. I'm going to just ask a couple of questions that are coming in through. Uh, I'm sorry. Um, a couple of questions that are coming through um, through Zoom. Um, Diane Sussman, she's asking, feeling unempowered sounds like most of the adolescents and uh, and early twenties. Why did the ISIS young people join ISIS? Bill, do you want to respond to that? It's it's a very good question. Um, I Doug touched on it a little bit. I mean. There have been a large number of studies that have looked at it and tried to figure it out. I mean, some of it is uh, a sense of um, uh, disempowerment. They, they didn't feel like their views were being represented. Um, some of it is economic. Um, some of it is a radicalization process that takes place via the internet. Uh, very powerful social media um, techniques are used now to uh, break through the, the sort of general noise of, uh, of, of societies that people live in, and they're, they're able to um, create these pathologies, I guess you would say, that um, attract these people, and they, these groups like ISIS have been very effective at, at utilizing these recruitment strategies, in, not only in the Middle East um, and in radicalized places there, but also in Europe. Um, and it's a it's a real challenge to find the right keys for de-radicalizing and turning the, the process in the opposite direction. It's a great question, but it's a it's it's um, it's complicated uh, background to it. Ambassador Sullivan, let me ask you a question that also came through um, uh, Zoom. Um, Moshe Emilio Lavi, Lavi asks, "What are the dangers and possible rewards?" of the current dynamics with Iran. Is there a reason to believe the recent steps to bring Iran to the negotiating table would delay the Iranian nuclear program? That's a really good question. I actually do lose sleep at night trying to think of what is gonna be next with Iran. Um, I'm not entirely sure what Iran's national goals are at the moment. Um, one of the things that is interesting about the modern Islamic state of Iran is the way in which it was founded, the way its constitution is written. And part of the constitution is essentially one condemns the United States. There are very few constitutions in the world that name another country specifically. But it also projects the revolution and claims to speak for not only all the Shia of the world, but all the dispossessed of the world. And they have set a goal of having creating an Islamic ummah that runs the entire world uh, by the standards that uh, uh, Iranian Shiism uh, would, would see as correct for the Islamic ummah. Uh, this is a very ideological position, and I'm surprised it has lasted more than 40 years, to be perfectly honest. Most revolutions don't maintain this kind of uh, fervor for so long. What has happened inside Iran is that they've also created a set of bureaucracies, um, a set of organizations in some ways parallel to the government structure, uh, which now have a financial stake in the future of Iran and expanding Iran. Um, and Iran is a relatively weak state and its state, in state institutions, especially in foreign policy, are relatively weak, where they have been able to create tension and theoretically fulfill their goals is where they have funded non-state actors um, in Lebanon, in Iraq, in Syria, um, in South America, in Afghanistan, in Pakistan, and other places in the world, which they see as essentially a forward defense. They, if you are sitting in Tehran, you see a series of American and British and French military bases stretching from Oman, all up the, the west coast of the Gulf, inside Iraq, uh, there used to be more American forces in Central Asia. You have got uh, US naval forces in the Indian Ocean, and they are surrounded by hostile powers, whether that would be India, Saudi Arabia, not so much Turkey. Um, and if you look at the history of the Iran-Iraq war, they see Iraq as a potentially hostile power. Um, they have created this fortress Iran that they try to send um, war parties out of, but try to protect, protect the interior. Um, 
Let me let me just. Yeah. It's, I, it's, it's, a, it, it, it's a really tough. It's a tough. I know the, all these topics require. Let me let, but let, let me go to what I wanted to get to is that the way to move forward may simply be to incentivize to incentivize Iran to act as a state institution and give up the levers of power that it has used through non-state actors and subverting other governments uh, around the world. Do you think that's possible? But that would require engaging with Iran as an equal. Some people are beginning to do that. It's gonna be very difficult for the United States uh, because of our politics, at, as Ambassador Patterson noted at the very beginning. Right. Hello. Give us your um, name, okay? Give sorry. us your name. Oh, I'm Nima. Um, firstly, I'd like to say how much of a pleasure it is to have such a distinguished panel here. Um, my question sort of builds off that with Iran. So uh, moving forward in terms of US-Iran diplomacy, despite the misalignment in our fundamental values and also inability to reach an Iran nuclear deal, um, what other room do you see for diplomacy um, negotiation outside of that realm in the coming years? particularly within the Biden administration. I'm also asking this as an Iranian American. Good question, Ambassador Patterson, how about this? So uh, on, on other openings for diplomacy with Iran, yeah, there were, there were actually quite a number of them that were, that were the nuclear agreement and keeping Iran from getting a nuclear weapon is obviously the highest priority. But over time, others have been identified. The one I personally worked on was counter narcotics. Uh, Iran has the highest degree of addiction in the world. So that's an area ripe for cooperation. Uh, the other thing, there were several on scientific cooperation and health and now pandemics, of course. So there were a number of areas that were explored uh, during, uh, before and after the nuclear agreement was negotiated in the Obama administration. And many of these efforts and many of these thoughts really go back decades. There have been sort of much, not unlike Cuba, there have been periodic opportunities for opening over many years, but none of them have prospered. Thanks. We are running down on time, so I want to want to get questions, and then we can expand on them. Go ahead. There, um, I'm Sarah Plana. Thank you so much for being here. Um, my main question is: What prospects do you see for resolving the major conflicts in the region, Libya, Syria, and Yemen? And especially, uh, I was interested in your thoughts about um, the role of state sponsors in those conflicts at all, given the fact that they have many incentives to continue their low-cost interventions. Sure, I heard that from Portland. Thank you. Uh, Sarah, I, I would say it's going to be very difficult to resolve these conflicts. Um, these are failed states, uh, largely speaking. Two of them um, are failing. Uh, and Syria is a third state that is uh, it has a functioning government, but the government is not able to control large swaths of the territory. So when you have huge uh, areas of ungoverned space, it creates vacuums, it creates uh, opportunities for bad actors to arm themselves, to, um, to act with impunity, um, and it makes it difficult for um, state actors to intervene with the state or partial failed state that's there uh, in a way that uh, creates effective diplomacy. Um, the situation in Yemen is a good example. Uh, you actually have now um, according to some analysts who have looked at it, seven Yemens uh, because of the way the country has fractured um, and different armed groups control different parts of the country, uh, some of them responding to uh, actors that are, are providing assistance. Iran, for example, is providing assistance to the Houthis. Very difficult for um, state actors which rely on diplomacy to get in there and resolve these types of, of conflict. And it's, it's going to create very dangerous, but it already has, but it's going to continue to generate very dangerous uh, situations outside of these uh, failing states for nation states to deal with, whether it's Europe, uh, even the United States, uh, and things like terrorism, 
uh, refugee flows, uh, and just ungoverned state, un, um, failing, failed states that create uh, significant levels of um, chaos and uh, potential humanitarian catastrophe. So it's, it's a huge challenge, and it's going to probably, I, I'm not optimistic that it's going to get better in the foreseeable future. Can I comment on that again from a, a more strategic level? I think that Americans and people in the world are going to have to change in their minds the paradigm of success in conflict. Uh, people have in their minds World War II, where 20 million people died over six years, and at the end, everything was fine, except for maybe the Iron Curtain and all that Eastern Europe stuff, but we, we created democracies, we created the German economy, same about Korea. So the standard of countries at war become friends and they prosper may be too difficult uh, to continue because most of the combatants in the current conflicts are not state actors. They are non-state or sub-state actors. And I think one of you brilliant students ought to be doing a master's thesis or a PhD dissertation on a new con how to conceptualize what actual victory or success in a non-state or sub-state conflict looks like. Yeah, that's, that's, that's a good point. Thank you. Hi everyone, so thank you for letting me in. My name is Putri Samudra, you can call me Trista. And my questions are, how do you think about, you know, the possibility of the US-China Cold War, which is always reported by many parties, uh, especially in the Middle East? And how does the Middle East uh, view it? Because uh, let's say we would like to talk about security or uh, versus economy. The stakes in the US-China Cold War are of course higher, for the Gulf Cooperation uh, Council or GCC, because America has a service, um, you know, to normalize the UAE as well as Bahrain or Israel as well as uh, Saudi Arabia, while China has emerged as the top importer of oil from the Gulf nations. And do you think that the great power competition, especially with China, will be the primary lens through which the U.S. will evaluate its alliances in every region around the world? And uh, the Gulf nations also realize that they need to enhance their strategic autonomy. Thank you. About China and the U.S. and the Gulf. Yeah. So here's the bottom line on that. Put the mic closer. Put it closer to your mouth. The Gulf, the Gulf, basically exists under the U.S. defense umbrella. The countries of the Persian Gulf uh, cannot export their oil and gas without the U.S. Navy. The Suez Canal cannot function without the U.S. Navy. And there's been a lot of talk about, about giving up our strategic position in the Gulf to China or Russia or anybody else. But, but these countries basically survive uh, because of the U.S. Now, the biggest beneficiary of that, because they're a recipient of oil and gas from the Gulf, is China. And I don't think the Chinese are about to jump in and patrol the Persian Gulf. And so, yes, of course, they're going to sell more goods. And the Russians, I must tell you, have paid a very, uh, a very a diplomatic hand, a weak diplomatic hand, brilliantly. So they've made inroads in the Gulf. But the bottom line is the defense umbrella. Thank you. Uh, I am very sorry, but I think we are out of time. We have zero minutes. Okay, all right, it'll be quick. Um, uh, thank you, I'm Theo Milanopoulos. I'm a PhD uh, graduate, actually, I just remembered, uh, postdoctoral fellow here at the, uh, the Parable Task. Um, I was wondering if uh, uh, you could share what, uh, over your careers, um, is your proudest achievement, and what, if you could implement one reform at the State Department, uh, what that would be? Well, I will tell you that my, as ambassador, my proud, proudest achievement was my ability to work with the Saudi leadership uh, in a very clear uh, and um, a very direct way on everything from human rights to uh, regional politics to counterterrorism you name it. And part of that was because it, I dealt directly with them. I did not deal with the press. I did not uh, issue press releases about our conversations. 
And I was, I developed relationships with the leadership such that if you have a relationship with somebody, uh, you are able then to bring tough topics to the table. And there was a question in, in Zoom about, uh, you know, Saudi Arabia and human rights. Well, I think that while we were there up to the end of the Obama administration, we made huge, huge progress. And I think you'll agree to this huge progress in human rights with Saudi Arabia. Uh, 90 degree uh, turn. And that's because we were fully engaged and because we had the dialogue and, and we, we didn't shy away from it. I think that's important. Let me take the second part. The State Department needs to get its people out of fortress embassies, and it needs to get embassies open in places like Libya. Benghazi was a was disastrous for the State Department, although risk aversion has been coming for a long time. The, the basis of diplomacy is relationships, and all these countries are relationship-based societies. On the second question, the thing, I was most proud of our successes in Colombia. Let me take the first uh, question because I actually agree with Ambassador Patterson on, on the second question. Uh, my proudest achievement was coordinating a world response to the military assault on Mosul during the fight against ISIS, where we had a coordination of American coalition and Iraqi military forces, both governmental and non-governmental, at the same time, we created civil military coordination mechanisms with the United Nations, European and Asian donors, um, literally all done around my dining table at the ambassador's residence in Baghdad. The point of this is to say that for people who think that the United States is not important in the world, that is not true. There is no other country yet that is able to bring together all of the countries of the world uh, around a single purpose, in this case, a dual purpose of defeating an enemy and caring for the hundreds of thousands of civilians were displaced. So I still think that there's a very important point, a very important role for the United States and for American diplomacy, pretty much everywhere in the world where you have these multivariate uh, variant, uh, conflicts. So uh, I'll give you the last just, word. Thank you. J thanks, thanks, Ambassador Westfall. Uh, just a couple of sentences. I think the service I'm most proud of was where I ended my service in Syria, uh, working to maintain that relationship with the SDF leadership under very difficult circumstances where our policy was um, in difficult uh, circumstances for a while and uh, there were uh, an invade there was a military incursion from Turkey so very difficult circumstances but we did manage to preserve it I was out there living in very austere uh, expeditionary diplomacy conditions and um, we were able to maintain those relationships and get out and about, uh, convey the sense that there was an American presence, an American commitment, and I think it made a big difference. Well, thank you very much. I want to thank Perry Worldhouse, but I also want to tell you that you had sitting in front of you three terrific uh, diplomats who have spent all of their lives representing the United States in very difficult places. And I thank them for joining us today. And if the live audience wouldn't mind giving a round of applause to our guests, or, or rather the in-person in audience since everyone's live. So before you all go, obviously, before you scatter to the four corners of, of Penn, and those of you online before you leave, I want to just make a couple of notes. So first of all, to thank all of you so much for spending um, time with us on a little bit of a gray day, but the conversation made it infinitely more exciting and worth turning out for. I have several takeaways that I just want to kind of comment on as we think about what we've learned in this panel. One has been the idea that's been put forward that the U.S. approach has been too fractious and there are too many conflicting impulses and how does the U.S. and engaging with the MENA region change that, think about it, analyze it, and perhaps do better. So we're in a multipolar world and it's worth thinking about what that means in terms of engagement in MENA and who allies should be with the U.S. and whether the U.S. leads from how the U.S. leads and how it leads ideally in coalition and what success looks like when one might have failed state and when one is not dealing with the typical actors that one would think, and is there a new paradigm for what engagement looks like? So I think there've been some very important questions raised during this panel that we can all think about. So I wanted to thank you all for coming in person and also wanted to thank the online audience um, for such insightful questions. We hope to see you for two upcoming events that I wanna mention to you. 
One is, in fact, on Thursday and is in person only at Perry World House, co-sponsored with Penn's Alexander Hamilton Society and featuring Corey Shockey, Senior Fellow and Director of Foreign and Defense Policy Studies on American Grand Strategy and the Role of the U.S. in the 21st Century. And then there is our next The Role Today, which happens on October the 13th, which will be happening both in person and online. We will examine the Uyghur crisis in China with experts from think tanks, academia, and human rights organizations. As always, you can access a recording of this conversation on our YouTube channel and can find out all about our other upcoming events by joining our mailing list and following us on social media for up-to-date information on critical contemporary global affairs and public policy issues. We'll drop those links for those of you who are online in the chat function. So thank you again, be well, and we will see you next time.